It's very easy to write this game off. It's ugly, it's clunky, and it continues to be a blemish on the face of the Street Fighter franchise. But does it deserve to forever be scorned? Probably yes, but that doesn't change the fact that this poor game, believe it or not, actually does possess a few genuinely amusing qualities that are easily overlooked. Hey everyone, and welcome to The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. And we're knee deep in video games at the movies month, where we're taking a look at games that inspired their own feature films. But in today's case, it's a game based on the movie, which was inspired by yet another video game. And if that sounds confusing, don't worry, because it is. That situation and today's game are both perfect examples of how the smallest changes can make something that once felt familiar instead feel slightly off. Like something's wrong, but you just can't put your finger on it. It's time to play Street Fighter the Movie. You know why this game exists? You know whose fault it is? Mortal Kombat. That's right. If it wasn't for a little upstart of a fighter and all those other fighting franchises that were popping up in the mid 90s, putting players into a tizzy, then there never would have been a Street Fighter movie game. Oh, we still would have gotten the movie itself since at the time Capcom was throwing the weight around. Weight that they had due to the runaway success of the 17 different versions of Street Fighter 2 that every arcade had on deck. So when Capcom stuck their foot into Hollywood's doorway, it was with a premise that took their initial martial arts conceit and turned it into what was essentially G.I. Joe with a bunch of handsome one dimensional characters with superpowers. So G.I. Joe. And at a certain point, someone must have thought, hey, we've already got all these actors in costume. Let's throw them in front of the blue screen, digitize the footage into sprites, and cash in on some of that hot MK action that the kids seem to love. But let's not develop it ourselves. Let's hand it off to a relatively untested company. So I guess it's really not Mortal Kombat's fault. It's incredible technology's fault. They're the reason I have to play this thing. Street Fighter, the movie, the game, hit arcades with all the force of a well-cooked noodle. Thanks to its bizarre renditions of characters we had only up to then seen as hand-drawn sprites, and also its absolutely bonkers gameplay. Infinite juggles, crazy extra special moves, and the mind-boggling inaccurate animations. This game was, and still is, considered by many to be the worst Street Fighter game ever. But they just had to port this thing to console too. Which is when Capcom realized that they maybe should have been involved in this game's development from the get-go. So during the porting process, they did the best they could to address the numerous issues that plagued the arcade version and bring this bastard game closer to a more traditional Street Fighter. Except, you know, with Raul Julia in it. The console version, in essence, is like a whole different game, and that's the version that I'm completing today, which means that I'm playing a game based on another game, which was based on a movie, based on yet another game, which is a sequel to a game that was inspired by a bunch of manga characters and real life karate people. And when you make it this far down the line with copies of copies and splinters of spin-offs, the very DNA of things starts to break down, which, as it turns out, is a pretty good descriptor of Street Fighter the movie on the original PlayStation. Oh, it's Street Fighter all right, but I wouldn't blame you for not recognizing it as such. With its decrepit rendition of one-on-one -on -one fighting and its plot that tries its hardest to emulate the films in which Jean-Claude Van Damme teams up with a bunch of other actors to take down Gomez Adams. So I guess at the end of the day, it's Capcom's fault that we got this game. Damn it, Capcom. Now, I admittedly walked into this with a bunch of negative preconceived notions, most of which were immediately proven correct. But aside from its copious amount of jank, Street Fighter the movie also has a lot of... a good amount of... It has a couple surprisingly delightful features. No, really! That's great news, General. Congratulations! On the contrary, I mourn. Okay. But to really appreciate the few things Street Fighter the movie does well, we first have to explore the many, many things it doesn't do that well. Like the cast itself. Don't get me wrong, most of the world warriors are here, but man do they leave a lot to be desired, even with the console version adding two characters. Now we got DJ- wait a minute, is that Miguel Ooh Baby Nunez Jr? Ooh Baby Ooh 
baby. And they also added in Jesus. F Look. I'm glad all these guys are here, but this cast is far from perfect, and it could never have turned out perfectly with the way that these characters are rendered in-game. Things do not bode well when they can't even be bothered to key out the blue screen for the intro animations. And, as it turns out, there are indeed certain animations that should never be attempted by human beings. Like, what the hell is Guile doing here? It's the startup of his flash kick, but it's just his standing animation moved up to make him airborne. There you go, guy. And Chun Li's dancing, while delightfully playful, seems entirely out of place. And what the hell is with Ryu's wind pose? Is that supposed to be his classic cross arm finish? It looks like someone off screen just called his name. Hey, Karate Man! This whole game feels like they technically delivered on the promise of a Street Fighter game, but they loopholed their way into a monkey's paw scenario because someone wasn't specific enough with the criteria. It only makes me wonder and shudder at what other characters would have been like in this style. The very slim Greg Rainwater is T-Hawk, throwing people around would have been something to see. And Dr. Dulcim stretching around everywhere? Yeah, it's easy to see why they didn't touch that one. But where the hell is Fei Long? Well, he got cut and replaced with this guy, Captain Sawada. He's a generic character in the film who played a generic role. And aside from Fei Long's chicken wing move, which he blatantly stole, he's got a generic move. Whoa, is that a teleport? Yo, calm down. I'm sorry I doubted you. Did you just super that guy with the power of pure shirtlessness? Fuck it. So Wada's the best character, and that's the first genuinely enjoyable thing about this game. You win. This weird mistake of a character just highlights how Street Fighter, the movie, the game, would have been better off embracing its own brand of weirdness, instead of selling the names of world warriors that already existed. Because now, thanks to this movie, and by extension, this game, there are tons of people out there that think that Blanca and Charlie Nash are the same guy. And let's set the record straight. Zangief is not, and has never been, a bad guy. He's a national hero, man. But you have to stick to what the movie brought to the table, which is why this game includes movie battle mode, an attempt to recreate the film's narrative with text boxes, low pixel images, and a smattering of fighting against the computer. And I hope you like playing as Guile, because he's the only character available. This mode actually feels like a choose your own adventure, except it's an adventure that I don't want to go on. After most fights, including an initial one where you're not even intended to win, love those, you get to have a Mei Ling style chat with Kylie Minogue's Cammy, who offers players a choice between two options, with each leading to a different opponent and a different path through this mode. Also, she, at best, looks like she does not want to be here, and at worst, like she's judging you for playing this game. This mode isn't that hard to complete, since a loss lets you rematch your opponent indefinitely or until the timer runs out. But navigating through it got very annoying. I don't want to spend any more time with this game than I have to, so it sucks to know there's an optimal way to reach the end that could be passing me by. It took me a while, but eventually I found the fastest, most efficient path to the end. But no matter what you do, you'll always end your journey by fighting against Sagat and then Bison himself. But after you beat the big baddie, you'll have to face a beefed up version of him him, known as Shin Bison, who, as far as I'm concerned, is no different than regular Bison. And I'm willing to bet that you can't even tell the difference either, because I've been indiscriminately swapping footage on both Bisons this whole time. An unsurprisingly anticlimactic end to a lackluster mode that I spent far too much time on. Oh, but I guess we're due for something positive about this game. So... Okay, you know what? Something I discovered very early on is that this game is where EX specials made their introduction into the Street Fighter universe, not in Street Fighter 3, and not even in Street Fighter EX. They appeared right here for the first time. And once your super meter is full, you can pull them off for free until you either use your super or until the round is over. My jaw dropped when the game let me keep firing off two sonic booms for free in order to keep the cheap-ass computer at bay. Sure, that probably isn't the most balanced choice in the world, but when you're on the road to completion, it comes as a delightful surprise and an unexpected piece of Street Fighter history. So that's something. You win. Once movie battle mode was over, I moved on to the real meat of this underwhelming entree, Street Battle, a fancy pants name for arcade mode. And even though I was starved to play as anyone other than Guile at this point, this mode quickly turned into a grind. This mode is as basic as they come, but at the same time, it also feels long as hell. Usually arcade modes clock in around eight fights, but this game just had to be special and make it 12, 
with absolutely no way to lower that number. I'm obligated to beat this mode with every character, so I immediately tried to make the process easier by lowering the round requirement. No go. Not even an option. And the whole task is made even longer by these long ass PS1 load times. I spent just as much time between fights as I did in them. I don't want to see these gross ass FMV victory screens if you have to take 40 seconds to load them. And of course, there's the AI, which is just as ridiculous as you'd expect. Look at this Ken and his inhuman reactions. This game's not unbeatable or anything, but it's also not even trying to hide the fact that it's reading the hell out of your inputs. It doesn't feel good to be constantly reminded that yes, I am indeed mindlessly grinding against a computer for hours. Beating Street Battle with everyone gave me a world tour of all the stages in the game, which are pretty accurate to the movie, but their assignments don't make much sense to me. This port is a goddamn good facsimile for Ken's stage, but nah, Kami hangs out here. And who chills in this dank-ass infirmary? Why Chun-Li, of course. Who else? And this jungle would be perfect for weirdo albino block, uh, but Sawada's claimed it. I ain't messing with him. Moving on. Oh, but here's another generally cool thing about this game that I learned while playing this mode for hours. The music is actually kind of dope. Well, half of it is. While some tracks are generic orchestral stuff that emulates the movie, the other half of the soundtrack is genuinely bumping stuff from Q-Sound. This stuff would have been right at home in any mid-90s Capcom game. This music could have had a life if it weren't tied to the sinking ship of a game. It's honestly the best aspect of the game and it deserves better. You and I deserve better than having to beat Street Battle on the hardest difficulty. After struggling it up with a bunch of characters, I found myself crawling back to Van Damme to get the job done. His turtling style, backed up by those EX Sonic booms, was the only thing that got me through this challenge without losing a single fight. And that's the only way to face Akuma. That's right, even though he's not in the movie, he's in the game. And he's played by a stunt guy. This dude fights like an absolute tool, which makes sense, but he too fell to the power of holding down back. There's even a code to unlock Akuma and play as him, which is kind of cool considering that this was one of the first times that he was ever playable. Is that a... Yeah, sure. That's another enjoyable thing about this game. Put it on the list. You win. Flawless victory. At the time, he was still very much a man of mystery, which may explain the fudge details in his design. Is that a spiked choker? Baby, what are you doing? But playing as Akuma was very useful when it came time to complete this game's final single player mode. It's called Trial Mode, which is yet another glorified name for something very simple. It's a gauntlet against the entire game's cast of 16, which isn't that much different from the 12 in Street Battle. But there's no continues, so you better believe I cheese my way through that mess with the demon. Jump back fireballs are just another way to turtle, and I'm not gonna spend any more time with this game than I have to. Thanks, Akuma. So while this game does feel like a train wreck most of the time, it's a train wreck that's not a complete disaster, thanks to a couple of neat qualities. That being said, whether you feel like you can't look away or can't bear to watch, I sympathize with you. Quick, change the channel! Attention, fellow loyal followers of our Lord General Bison. Do you wish you had headphones with a battery that lasts through your entire guard duty shift? Are your usual wireless listening devices getting their frequencies crossed with critical communiques? Introducing the new Commuter 2 from Cove, a lightweight, portable Bluetooth speaker with enough potential volume to drown out the loudest pleas for help from your doomed captives. But most important is its ability to split into two, providing a surround sound effect for when you're listening to the gospel of General Bison, or a left and right speaker effect for when you're singing along to the daily, mandatory recitations of the Shadaloo National Anthem. Water resistant, and with up to seven hours of listening on a single charge, the Commuter 2 is the official portable speaker of Bison's personal forces. And if you use the link in this video's description, you can get yours for over 60% off, which exchanges to roughly three bison dollars now that our illustrious Lord and Master has taken over most of the Northern Hemisphere. Get your commuter to today, and remember, hail bison. Glory to the Pax Bisonica. Is this a joke? I mean, yeah, kinda. That became clear when the game rewarded me for beating movie battle mode with the music video, straight out of the 90s. It's not entirely out of left field as the song was featured on the movie soundtrack and the video features a lot of the actors from the movie. They're not in costume or anything, but they are looking fine as hell. Look at Balrock giving you the bedroom eyes. Plus, the song isn't that bad either. 
But things aren't so cool when it comes to the rewards for beating street battle mode. There are, of course, the obligatory character endings featuring text and still images, and that's hardly a reward for trudging through the AI's crap. And to top it all off, if you manage to beat Big Bad Akuma, you're rewarded with a strange radio broadcast over a black screen. It's weird. I have a lot of unanswered questions about Street Fighter the movie, but I don't really have any motivation to find out the answers. There are far better Street Fighters to spend your time with, and completing this game, while not too time consuming, is pretty grating. Normally, when we complete fighting games around these parts, I can convince people to try out versus mode with me for shits and giggles, but I didn't have the heart to do so this time, and I think that's pretty telling. Mr. Van Dam, I think I've had enough. When I completed Street Fighter the movie, there were... 17 long trips through street battle. If the AI input reading doesn't get you, then the load times will. Supposedly, two Bisons defeated in movie battle, but I'm not so sure. 16 opponents defeated in trial battle with the help of jump back fireball. Countless EX Sonic Booms tossed, because I ain't paying for them. 13 hours of total playtime, and 25 years since we've been able to play as Captain Sawada. Let's correct that mistake, Capcom, shall we? Street Fighter the movie definitely has value with this handful of overlooked positive qualities but mostly as a good example of how not to change a franchise completing this game is out of the question since there's no reason to beat the game with everyone especially not the hardest setting and you don't even need to beat this game at all before you see all it has to offer but if you get the chance to try it for a few minutes you shouldn't pass up that train wreck so with that in mind I give this game my completionist rating of play it. play it. That's all the time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. Again, a big thank you to today's sponsor, Cove. Check the link in the description down below for more information. Supporting them supports the show. That's it. That's all, guys. I've been Gerard, and I'll see you next week for another brand new episode of The Completionist. Bye-bye. Yep, still waving. You can write wave down below in the comments. No, I'm really Gerard. Really, I am. <laughs>